Uh, we are absolutely honored and privileged to have with us uh, a legend like yourself. Thank you for being with us today, Ted. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Uh, how about a round of applause from everybody there? Hey, uh, let, let me just start off. This is not good the way we're... Turn around. The people up in front, turn around and look behind you. Everybody's scattered out all over the place. <laughs> Why aren't the people over here and the people over here... And, Come on, get in the center so we can go one time. Everybody family. over here, come to the center. Come on, people from over here, get in the center, please. <laughs> Man that knows what he wants. Well, I know I'm going to break my neck going here. <laughs> right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you all. I appreciate you coming. Yes, and thank everybody uh, again. Um, for Ted and for myself, for you guys for being here today. Um, we're all here to celebrate this man and this fantastic franchise. Um, let's start things off pretty easily, I, I guess, for you. Should we open it up to the crowd or? Well, sure, why not? Let's go, all right, right with the crowd. We got some questions right off the bat to start off. Okay. Sure. Uh, there was a movie you did the same year when you did Friday 13. You were in Starman. I was just wondering how it was like working with John Carpenter and actor Jeff Bridges. I had, I had the pleasure of working with Jeff Bridges five, four different times. I started out with him with Cutter's Way, uh, Against All Odds, Starman, and there's one more and I can't remember it. But what a great guy to work with. Wonderful, wonderful man. I've seen Cutter's Way recently. It's good. I enjoyed it as well. But the, well, I tell you, if you met him in person, you, 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 wouldn't meet, you, you couldn't meet a nicer person. Wow. He's just a wonderful guy to work with. It's good to know about the Big Lebowski. <laughs> now, what, what about, uh, like you had asked, uh, what was it like working with a, a legend like John Carpenter? Well, John Carpenter I've known for quite some time. I worked with him to begin with. Uh, I can't even remember the name of the film. Oh, that's with Starman, I believe, was the really mm -hmm. first film I did with him. But I also worked with him in several, two other films. And again, my memory at 93 fails me. I can't remember the names of them. <laughs> but uh, a great guy to work with. Uh, and Jeff Bridges, of course, I uh, go way back with Jeff. I go back with Jeff when he was just an actor like myself in the early stages of the motion picture business. Awesome. Now, you started off as a stuntman as well. And uh, I, I, yeah, and I, you know what? I've never gave up, except I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just too old to do it anymore. Now, you had, but you've worked for legends like Clark Gable, John Wayne. Um, there's so many legends you've worked with. Is there anyone that stands out in particular for you? Well, how can you make it not stand out with Clark John Wayne and Clark Gable? So Victor Matur, Rock Hudson, all the big guys at six foot three or four. I had the pleasure of meeting him and working with him. And now uh, they're all gone, you know, uh, like the way of the flowers. When they dwelt, they go. And uh, we've lost them all. Uh, it's a shame to say it that way, but there's new ones coming up all the time. So we'll get new ones. Sitting right here in the audience right now, there may be four or five big name actors that two years from now they'll say, hey, I was sitting there listening to that idiot Ted White, and they <laughs> am a big idiot, but I'm a big actor. It could happen to anybody. Awesome. Uh, any other questions? There you go. Yeah. Mr. White, uh, thank you. I can't, I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Come on up. If you're, talk, if you're talking about uh, Joe Zito? Yes. Joe Zito's a nice man. He, I, of course, we had a little bit of a problem, but uh, he's a good guy. There's nothing wrong with him. I, I was a little temperamental, and uh, I don't know if these folks know the story of what happened, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief with it. Uh, <clears throat> this was in February, and it was at midnight, and we're on a lake, and it was very, very, very cold, about 23, 24 degrees. We had a girl in a rubber boat, around, not a boat, just a round tub, 
uh, you know, that you get into in, in the water in the summer. And she had a bikini bathing suit on. <clears throat> Camera was set up on the beach, shooting out her in the water. And uh, she finally said to Zito, the director, she said, you know, I'm, I'm awful cold, could I come in a little while? He said, no, we're putting new film on the camera, just take it easy. And I'm standing over by him, and again, she had about 10 minutes went by, and she said, please, I, I've got to get out, I'm getting very, very cold, and I, I need to get out and get warm for him. He said, no, no, we'll have film. So by then, I could look at her, and she, her, she, her teeth were just rattling, she was really, really cold. And you can imagine with a bikini on, 23 degrees at 12.30 at night, and I went over to Joe and I said, Joe, let's get her out of the water. And he said, number one, let's get this straight. I'm the director, you're the stunt man. You do the stunts, I'll direct. And I said, Joe, you're a dirty, rotten son of a bitch. That girl's freezing to death. And I'll walk if she don't get out. He said, what do you mean you'll walk? I said, I'll walk off the set. I won't do this show. He said, are you serious? And I said, watch me. And I turned around and started walking away. And he said, all right, stop. Get her out of the water. That's a true story, but to this day, that girl suffers her nose, her ears, her eyes. She, I, I don't, there's a name for it. I can't tell you the name of it, but she still suffers from it to this day because of a director who wanted to keep his shooting on time and not get behind in the film. And to save that time, he wouldn't let this girl out of the water. And that happens a lot of times in the motion picture business. Directors take advantage of the people working for him because he's the director, he's the know-it-all, he's the man and with, with all the advice from everybody on the, on the business. And if he can't tell people what to do and tell them how to do it, he's not the director anymore. So with Joe Zito, that was the big issue with him. He wanted everybody to know he was the big kahuna on the show. He could have crossed this girl her life. And he's still the girl to this day, like I said before, and I'm being redundant. She still suffers from it. Sad. I don't want to make an issue of it, but I thought you should know that. I think we all applaud you for that. That's a humanitarian thing. We need more of that. I can't hear you. Uh, that's, that's a very human thing to do, and I think we need more of that in today's day and age. Um, I just had another question, too. What was it like, um, of 1A, 1B, 1C? What, what was it like to work with uh, Corey Feldman? And, uh, <laughs> Yeah, would you, what advice would you give to anybody that's thinking about getting into this business, whether it's directing, acting, stuntmen, uh, screenwriting? Do you have any advice for that? So that would be well, let, let's start with Corey Feldman. Thank you. And end there. <laughs> 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 no, we've, we've, we've settled our differences. Uh, he's all right, and Corey's a nice guy. He was just, when I worked with him, he was just 11 years old and working with a bunch of adults. And he was, you know, an 11-year-old kid sitting on a set. Uh, there's nothing for him to do. And uh, he gets mischievous. He gets into trouble, like any kid would, you know. And that's where it all started. He started having a time with me, with getting behind me and, and tickling my ears or something with twigs and sticks and just different things. And because of that, people made a bigger issue of it than it really was. Uh, I got after him a couple of times. but. I, I never really hurt him. I had one opportunity to get him, and I got him pretty good <laughs> by the neck. But anyway, <laughs> I didn't hurt him. The kid's all right. I was told he was coming to this show, and I was looking forward to seeing him again. But anyway, he's not here now. Uh, thank God. Anyway. <laughs> oh, I love Come on, some people out there. Who? Any questions I can answer? Yeah. Is it true that Yes, I did, and I'll tell you why. It's a little tough to talk about it, but since you brought it up, I'll tell it. Uh, I had watched this kid grow from the time he was four years old, and I have a, where I live, <clears throat> I have a woodworking shop. That's my hobby is woodworking. And uh, between the property where he lived and mine, uh, there's gated, there's a one gate in there that he used to come over and watch me do woodworking. And uh, from the time he was like six or seven years old, he grew up watching me do woodworking. And, and 
we became, we came, you know, we became friends. I mean, I, as an adult and then as a kid, but I, I liked him because he liked woodworking. He liked working with wood and he liked watching me do it. And little by little, he would do a little bit with me. Time went by. And then I didn't see him for three or four months and I couldn't figure out what the heck happened to him. And I saw his dad one day pulling out of the driveway and I happened to be walking over by him and I said, Art, where's the, where's the court? Not court, but Lewis. And he said, uh, he has cancer and he's in the hospital. Well, that took a, that, it was a, a jolt to me to know that, that that young kid, at that time, I think it was 12 or 13, had cancer. And I didn't know that it was, actually they said it was terminal. Uh, it, it's hard to go back and talk about it <clears throat> and not get a little upset, but I'm not gonna do it in that way. Uh, if the people out here in the audience has anybody that's ever been affected with cancer, just raise your hands up. Let me just see how many people know. If, I wish you people up in front turn around and look back. Keep your hands up for just a second. You know, 98% of the people in here have been affected in one way or another by cancer. And you know it is beatable. You know it is. We can beat it. And they're beating it day after day. And it's just a shame it didn't happen 30 years ago that we didn't find a cure for it 30 years. We don't have a cure now, but we're 90 percent. We're 90 percent closer to having a cure than we were 30 years ago. I didn't mean to get into this that far. Go ahead. Any other questions? Another question over there. Well, I got one. Sure. You're in this movie called The Hidden. You did a, the movie The Hidden. The Hidden. It's a movie you've done in 1987. You did a stunt. What movie? The Hidden? The Hidden, yeah. The Hidden. Yeah. The hidden. hidden with a D. Yeah. <laughs> you, I think you play like a secret agent man who gets shot by the alien, who, you know, the guy who's yeah. the star? Uh, Kyle McLaughlin, the guy from Doom. The, the Hidden, I know you did. The Hidden with yeah. Kyle McLaughlin? Yeah. Hmm. Well, well, it was just a brief scene where you, I saw you got shot like twice in the arm or something in that movie. There, there was a scene where, um, where the alien was chasing the senator, you were protecting the senator in that film towards the end of the movie. I was wondering if you remember shooting that scene. Um, Jerry, can, can you tell me what he's saying? Well, what's the name of it? What year did I do that? 87. <laughs> I, I know do I have to pull up my IMDb right now? <laughs> Should we check it out? Want me to check it for you? No, no, I'll just explain to the people. Folks, <clears throat> I made a living working in the motion picture business, and I worked five days a week and sometimes six days and seven days on location. It's very hard to go back and remember things that I did 30 or 40 years ago. And even though they're big hits and, and are, were hit, big hits then and, and still are to some people if they go and see them again for the second or third time. But I didn't remember making a picture called a hidden. And this I don't remember that incident. This is it here. Now I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happens when you get to be 93. That's what happens when you have a career like this man's and you do as many movies as he does. <laughs> Uh, do we have any other questions out there? We had one in the back there. It, speak, speak up if you don't mind. So, uh, I, I, you were offered the role of Jason in a couple of other Friday the 13th movies after the final chapter, but you turned it down. I can hear about every other word. So he said you were offered a few other uh, roles at Jason after the final chapter, but you had turned them down? Uh, uh, Is there any reason why you turned down the role again? Well, number one, I had an opportunity to do uh, <coughs> five and six. <coughs> Excuse me. I felt that for having done four, there wasn't anything I could add to make five and six better than what I had already done. I'm not saying that somebody else couldn't do it better. They could and they did. All I meant was, I thought everything that I knew about what I should do in number four, I did. And that was the best I could do. But I thought 
possibly a new person with a new outlook on that particular actor and what he was going to do would be better for it than me. And that's why I didn't take it. Good answer. Yeah. Steve. I never heard anything. So you, you follow two other actors playing the part of Jason. Did you take any part from their roles and incorporate it into yours, or did you do your own take on Jason? You know what? I hate to t <coughs> excuse me. I hate to tell you this. I never saw any of the Jasons before that. I never saw the, any of the picture. I, I just didn't go to them. My young, I have two boys, and my youngest boy had seen one or two of them, and when I told him that I was going to do one, he got very excited about it and said, Pop, could I come down and watch, which he did. But no, I hadn't seen any of them at all. I, and I didn't, I didn't have anybody to, to bounce off of, as we usually say. I just had to go in and do what I felt was right. And I didn't know whether it was right or it was wrong. But I, I made up my mind that I wasn't going to walk like Boris Karloff. <laughs> I made up my mind I was going to run, and I did it. And everything I thought that a man would do if he's healthy he should do. He shouldn't try to make himself a cripple if he's not. And that was my take on the whole thing. And I think a lot of people, especially in this crowd, I'm just looking around as you were saying that, and I think a lot of people appreciated that take that you took on it, you know, going away from the, the slow walk, but yet he's still going to end up in front of you somehow. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a great decision that you made. Do we have another question over there? All right, my little man. What did he say? How was it work? How what was it like working with John Wayne, with Marion? <clears throat> well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> good uh, question. <laughs> I met I met John Wayne in 1957 on the set of Rio Bravo, and uh, I didn't know when I at the. T Let me go back a little bit. There's a place in Hollywood where you go down and, and get wardrobe and wardrobe is what you wear in the motion picture business when you're doing a part or doubling somebody and uh, I was working for Warner Brothers and they sent me down to get dressed and I went down and in the green room that's where the big name stars are and where the stuntmen and the, and the actors and so forth are in what they call the overall room where everybody goes in there and have nine or ten different people trying to wait on you. In the green room, when I walked in, the lady there at the desk said, Ted, you go to the green room. And I said, well, I think you're wrong. I'm just a stuntman. She said, no, you're doubling somebody in the show, so you go to the green room. Well, the green room was where all the actors wore the, got their costumes. I had no idea whose costume I had, but they were fitting me in it, and as it turned out everything I put on fit me perfect. They didn't have to alter anything, the shirts, pants, everything fit me perfect, even up to the boots. So <clears throat> uh, three days later, I'm told to report to, uh, to the studio, and they're taking me by car to the airport and flew me to Tucson, Arizona. And we got to Tucson late that afternoon, and we were scheduled to start working the next morning at 6.30. And when I, next morning at 6.30, got up, went down, and walked right on the set, which is in the old Tucson. There's a movie set there. I don't know if any of you folks have ever been there, but it's an actual street on both sides that they've been shooting on for years and years, shot all kinds of movies there. I went down there to get my wardrobe on, and the guy that put wardrobe on me said, this is funny that everything fits you to a perfect T. We don't have anything but what your head size, and I said, seven and an eighth, and he said, that's the only thing that's different. The guy you're doubling is seven and a half, or seven and three eighths. And I said, well, then I, I don't wear a hat. And he said, no, we'll fix the hat where to work. So I went, I went out on the street. I wore these clothes, put them on, got out on the street and sat down. And about 20 minutes later, I see the rest of the crew coming in. They're setting up a camera shot for the street. And I looked down, and here comes a guy walking up. And I, I looked and looked again, and I said, oh, my God, that's John Wayne. Now you gotta think, here's a guy that was only 19 years old and I grew up worshiping John Wayne and here I'm seeing him walk down the street and he's wearing the same clothes I got on. 
And I said, oh, this can't possibly be. How am I going to be able to tell my kids or my people around the house where I live that I double John Wayne? They're not going to believe it. And I met him for the first time. And his first words, he said, what's your name, kid? And I said, Ted White. He said, you play chess, Ted? I said, yes, I do. And he said, sit down. We're going to play. I played chess with him for three or four times. He beat me every time. And that was, that was my induction to John Wayne. And I had the pleasure of making five films with him afterwards. What a nice, nice man. Wonderful guy. Great story. Great question. Uh, we've got one right back here first. Yep, with that. <laughs> How was it uh, working with uh, Walter Brennan? Walter Brennan? <laughs> uh, you do Walter better than Walter. <laughs> Walter Brennan's a wonderful guy to work with. He's just a, a character, you know. But uh, that character comes out in him in every film that he does. He plays the same guy all the time. It's just like Wayne. Wayne plays the same guy all the time. He's John Wayne. He wouldn't be anything else. He can't be Cesar Romero. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wait, stop. You know something? This is ridiculous. I can't hear you. Well, well, just let me finish. Would you mind getting up and coming up this way and then say, let's talk again? Because the people are getting tired of me hollering, I can't hear you. You <laughs> say back and forth. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm saying myself being an extra in movies, Gettysburg and The Blue and Gray, uh, it was a lot of work. I'm a historical reenactor. We come with all our own props, our own guns, and and so the prop department liked us because we had everything. Uh, on the movie Gettysburg, there were 6,000 of us there. And I know Teddy Turner liked to have every ounce of sunlight there was. You had the, it was a lot of work. Yeah. And I noticed you, but it was a good feeling doing it too, though. I'm just saying I appreciate it. Well, on the Alamo, we had 12,000 mounted Mexicans uh, for the, the initial charge of the Alamo. And they were in color costumes, red, green, and white, and they were mounted on horses. And when the first cannons went off, there, there was the biggest exodus of men and women and horses, that you, not women, but I mean, half these horses never heard of any kind of a rifle, pistol shot or anything, much less a cannon. And they scattered, they went everywhere. It took the Wranglers nearly three weeks gathering up horses and we never got all the horses back. And we never got all the guys back that were on the horses. Uh, that's how bad it was, because nobody thought of rehearsing the horses to the, to the cannons. You know, they, they, now, yeah, with, with a gunshot, we can rehearse them. But a cannon, never thought about it. So it, 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 because of that, another man, we lost him because of it. He got killed. But that's, I'm glad you brought it up. There are things in the motion picture business when you're working that you know you're going to do it. Everybody knows you're going to do it. But the very small things to get it ready to do it are sometimes overlooked. And I don't want to make this, and I don't want to be redundant. I want to, I want to tell it to you one time the best way I can. When we did so Horse Soldiers, we lost a stuntman on it only because what, they, what we did in rehearsal, what we did in rehearsal is not what we did when the shot was on, when the cameras were rolling, and I'll explain it to you. We had two guys working on the show. One was a stuntman, big heavy set guy. He was in the late 60s, and he'd gained a lot of weight. He was down, he was probably 260, 270 pounds. His brother was a wrangler on the show, and for people that don't know what a wrangler is, that's the guy that takes care of the horses, and that's what his brother was doing. Well, in the show, what we were gonna do, there's a whole row of cannons, probably as long as this room, and the cannons were spaced six feet apart. Back in those days, a cannon had a fuse on the top of the, sh of the, of the, of the, shell of the barrel of the canyon, Cannon. And the only way you could fire it is have a lit torch, touch the top of it, and that 
ignited the powder and blew the cannon. The cannon blew a shell out. All of this was set up in advance. So I was leading six horses in front of this row of cannons and for the rehearsal, they did not have the fire that each cannon would have had beside it. That fire has to be there so they can fire each cannon. They take a, a torch and touch it to that fire and then touch it to the top of the cannon that makes the cannon fire. Everybody understand what I'm talking about mm -hmm. now? Well, they didn't do it in rehearsal. We just rode the horses by. So right behind me is this guy, the ex-stunt man. He's, at, he's in the age of 60 and way overweight. And he, he asked me, he said, Ted, how fast are we going to go? I said, well, tell me how fast you want me to go. He said, well, just right out of a, a little gallop, just a small, short gallop on the take when the cameras are rolling. And I said, fine, that's what I'll do. The only difference we didn't do was we didn't light the fires beside all the cannons that we're going to run the horses, ride the horses down in front of. So when we got ready to go, and they, they lit all the cannons, but they didn't light them. They, they, let, they lit the scene, but they didn't put the fires on. The fires are all automatic. I have to back up and tell it to you another way. <laughs> to have fires all down in front of all those cannons, there's a line that runs right in front of the cannons, and it's got gas in it, natural gas. Oh. And they, they put them on, they have a, a, a burner on each one by the cannon. It makes it look like a fire with wood stacked around it. Everybody unfollowing what I'm saying? Like a Bunsen burner. Yeah. So that wasn't done. We, we, we did the walk with the horses and everything, but the fire was never on. So when we got ready to shoot it, they hollered action. They turned the flames up, and the horses were right by the fire. The horses were here. The fire was here. The horses scotched to the right, and when they did, it was automatic and fast. Well, the rider went off to the left, and that was the guy that got killed. He went off to the left and went straight down, <coughs> hit his head, and snapped his neck. And uh, his brother was a wrangler on the show. So, I, I didn't want to get into that. wasn't <laughs> not something you want to talk about. But, uh, it happens in the business. It, it does happen in the business. Uh, I believe you had a question there, Patriot's Hat. Yeah, you want to come right up? No, because really there wasn't that much stunt work in the final chapter. In fact, if you watch it carefully, there was no exciting car chases or high falls or fires or anything like that. Well, going through the window, anybody in here could do that. It was candy glass. <laughs> well, no, you know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it was candy glass. And in the motion picture business, it's glass made out of candy. And it's clear and you can see right through it. But there are different kinds of it. People, some of the guys, when they pour them up to make a window, candy glass, like for a horse to go through a window, they'll pour it very, very thin. But then if they're gonna have, let's say, a, a windy day, they'll pour it thicker so the wind won't break the glass. That's how easy it is to break. They'll make it thicker. So they, they, they can make the candy glass in the window as thick as they want it or as thin as they want it. So when we did it with horses, now, I've got myself off on another, I have to explain something else. When we did it with horses, get a horse to jump through a window, you can't just take a horse and get on him and ride him through a window, he won't go. So we covered their eyes, and here's the way we did it. We took a ping pong ball and cut it in half, and on each half we painted a horse's eye. Then we took both halves and glued them on a the horse's face. Now the horse can't see anything. As long as he can't see anything, are you going to talk or am I going to talk? Oh, sorry. That's okay. I just thought maybe I'd listen to you. <laughs> anyway, that's how we got the horses to go through windows. The ping pong ball, put their eye, drew an eye on it, 
and then glued it over their eyes. What the horse can't see, he'll, he'll go ahead, and as long as you spur him, he'll go straight ahead, or whichever way you guide him. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Yeah, awesome. Okay, I got you. Come on up. I don't understand what you're saying. So when you're watching, so I, if I can kind of paraphrase there, um, when you're watching the newer movies, um, do, like have you watched any of the newer movies, the newer Friday the 13th movies? And when you watch them, are you seeing some of your own stunts being done there? Are you seeing the way that you play Jason be kind of relived through newer actors? Uh -huh. Did I get that kind of right for you? Oh. Yeah, part two, part three, part one. I'm glad you guys hook I didn't remember a word of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was um, so you were just asking basically in in the newest uh, Friday thirteenth movie they, they do kind of a rehash and show all of the previous kills. Uh, we're not sure if it's all just from the first movie or from part one, two, and three, as he was saying there. But had you seen any of those, though? Like, I guess I can piggyback on that. Have you seen any of the newer movies, and what do you think when you see them? <laughs> I hate to admit, I never watched any of those. <laughs> well, I, you know, I didn't. And no, it wasn't because of, you know, uh, it, it wasn't a policy to go see it. It's just that... I was working, trying to make a living for my family, and I went, I went ahead and did my own jobs. And for me to go back and watch a Friday the 13th, there was no money in it. I couldn't, I mean, well, it's just something you, won't, you don't do. And if, long, if you're trying to make a living in Hollywood, you take a job as it comes up. If you can't get a job, you know, then you're setting it home. So it just makes common sense. You take any job, not any job, but you take 90% of the jobs that are offered to you to keep working. Awesome. And, Going to see Friday the 13th, I, didn't, I couldn't make any money going to see the ones that I had already done, or the ones that other guys had done. Mm, fair enough. Uh, you got one more? Yeah. Come on up. Um, or, when you were doing the westerns out in Arizona and stuff, did you have to have the snake wranglers go over first thing in the morning to make sure there was none? No, the what? Snakes, rattlesnakes? So when you were doing that, when you're filming westerns like you, like you were with uh, John Wayne and that, did you have anyone that was going out ahead of time checking for snakes and that stuff in the area because of the areas that you filmed? All the snakes were on the set riding horses. <laughs> no, 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 we, we, didn't, we didn't have anybody looking for snakes, uh, believe me. There was enough snakes on horses. You were the one testing for it on your own. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, my little man. So first you were a Marine. Oh, I like that. So first you were a Marine, then you were a boxer. Was that right? Football, play football, then a boxer, then a stuntman. Have you always just wanted to be a tough guy? Is that the question I got right there? <laughs> have you always wanted or have wanna, you just always been? <laughs> I want to give this, make this perfectly clear right now. I never was, never wanted to be, and never will be a tough man, a tough guy. I'm just an old man making the middle of it, that's all. <laughs> no. Then why would you be those He's asking, why would you want to do all those things, Zane? Because you've got to be a pretty tough guy to do all that stuff. I think we no. all kind of look at you as, you know, this well, I tell you what, than life guy. It, it makes come down to very simple. Do you want to eat? You do the work. If you don't want to eat, don't do the work. Fair. Hundred <laughs> percent. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, do you want? Do you mind just coming up a little bit closer so we can hear you? Awesome. Was there any other stuntman that you particularly enjoyed working with? Was there any other stuntman that I enjoyed? <clears throat> Ninety percent of the time, when you go on these shows, there are other stuntmen that you do work with. Some of them are old guys like myself. Some of them are young guys that are just breaking into the business. And sometimes you have the, the privilege of helping the younger guys come along by showing them new things that you did, you know, in, in your older age and things that you learned to do to make life easier for you in the business. And there are many things that you can do to make life easier for you in the business. <coughs> Excuse me. 
I won't go into that right now because it takes a long, drawn out thing. But uh, most of the guys that work that you work with now are seasoned stuntmen. If you're on a major motion picture, the younger guys that are just breaking in, most of them are on television until they get their salt behind them and know more about what they're doing. Then they graduate to a major motion pictures and big films. Uh, but television is the mainstay of 99% of the stuntmen in Hollywood. Uh, you're, that's where you're gonna get your bread and butter day in and day out. Now, if you go on a big film, you can go on a big film and stay on it for six or seven months, where with television, it's one day or two days. Except in, back in the eras of 19, 40, no, 56, 40, 56, 57, 58, Warner Brothers had four different shows going that were Westerns. I can't remember all of them. I did, but many times I'd do two of them or three of them in one single day. I'd do one and finish early in the morning and I'd, they'd switch me over to another one and I'd finish that. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, at the very end of the, all of this, I did three of them in one day. But then the Westerns finally just blew out and we went in then to car chases. Uh, it was Hollywood gangsters, that type of thing. Uh, there's words for it that I'm not using properly, but uh, I, yeah. I, I think you're talking most, more or less the Westerns. Is that what your question was? Or am I did, did? Yeah. Well, yeah, there was there. There's uh, there's several of the stunt guys that I enjoyed working with. Uh, like I said, and I and I, I know you don't want to keep hearing it, but as old as I am, most of the guys I worked with are gone. You know, they're not around anymore. And uh, there were several of them there that I, that I started out with, and they just and uh, we worked together for many years. And and uh, two of them I watched get killed. Oh while I was working with them. But that makes a very sour discussion here and I'm not trying to do that. Well, how about a happier question for you? <laughs> a little bit easier one. Um, as, a, as a stuntman and as a, such a stuntman that's known so worldwide, do you yourself have a favorite stunt that you've done? Is there something that, like you're like, this is my, this is my jam, this is, this is what I do best? Oh, that's a tough question. Uh, I'm like Barbara Walters. I'm coming with them hard. Folks, this is my wife talking. She doesn't know what she's saying. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say, honey? The uh, fight scene with Jeff Bridges and Against All Odds was a standout. And of course, the, the Patari. Oh, the Jeep turnover. The Atari scene with the rhino. Oh. Your standout stunts. That okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think, what was that question the guy asked me, though? He wants to know about the... Who your favorite... Uh, other stuntmen that you work with. Yeah, stuntmen to work with. Well, this wasn't another stuntman. I was the only one in the Jeep. <laughs> Well, it's one of the favorite, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and a movie called Hatari. I don't know, any of you ever see that movie? Raise your hand up so we can see. Right. Uh, just a few of you. There's a lot of people in here that haven't seen it. That's all right. Uh, this was done in Africa in uh, 1960. And John Wayne, Bruce Cabot, and Elsa Martinelli, that was part of the cast. I was fortunate enough to go over to double John Wayne and to shoot a second unit. The second unit, for those of you that don't know, is the stuff that the first unit don't have time to shoot. Most of that is action. And then not only just the action, but drive-bys. A drive-by is when your camera's set up and a car goes by or a wagon goes by or a horse, that's called a drive-by. Uh, that kind of stuff, the director doesn't want to mess with it. He wants to get the real acting going and he goes with that and gives that to the second unit. And the second unit would be me shooting that kind of stuff. So the one shot that I was not the second unit, I was the first unit, was I was in a Jeep. How many here, again, show me hands that saw uh, Atari? 
Quite a few. Well, there's four of you to know. But then you know the Jeep, the stuff with the Jeep was, I'm in a Jeep and we're driving, we're out in the desert and I'm the passenger and the driver at that time, the driver was on the right side of the Jeep, not the left side, which normally are, there it is. We, in the show, the script called for this rhino to charge the Jeep. So as we were driving around looking, we had a spotter plane in the air looking for rhinos and he was radioing back to the company and the company would take the radio then and we had a radio with us in the Jeep, the guy and myself, and they would say, well, we found one, but we don't know if we can get him over here. And then if they finally found one, they said, now make a left turn, come over this way. We finally got over to where the rhino was and they, they found a big male. And they said, okay, this is the one we like and uh, go ahead and, and get in close enough and let him charge. So the camera car, they made one of, two of them, were completely flat bed, just a flat bed all together. And then the driver's seat was the only seat in there. And then on the back of it was like the bed of a truck. We had two cameras mounted. So the truck could go out and no matter which way they were shooting, they were shooting it into an open field. Well, when we got out there, we saw this rhino, a big male, and uh, the driver that was driving it was a guy named Kerry Lofton, who passed away a few years ago, and myself, I was a passenger. And so as we came into the scene, Paul Helmick was a second unit director and associate producer of the picture. He saw the rhino and he said, this is the one we want. And he said, I'll tell you when to get ready and start. Now here's what happened. And here's how you had to do it. In the scene, what it called for in the, on the script is for the rhino to gore the passenger and the horn go through his left leg. So <clears throat> Howard Hawks had a horn made up and had a leg made up. And the leg was from the knee up to the hip and the horn was an actual rhino horn about this long. And he did a tight, tight close up of a horn going through a leg and the blood squirting out and it looked as real as it could possibly be. Now that was already shot, that was all done. So now we're in the Jeep and here is this big male rhino and Howard Hawks is talking to Paul Helmick, the second unit director, and he said, this is the rhino we wanna shoot. Tell Ted and the guy driving, this is it. And we'll let him know when we're shooting so we can go through it. Cause here's what had to happen. To make it look real, the pants I'm wearing, I have to, the rhino has to go through my left leg. So they take my pants and they sand the top of the pants with sandpaper, make it tissue paper thin. Then they put a metal plate all the way around my leg and we put a squid. A squid is like, the cap in a shotgun that goes off, that makes it fire, that's just a squid. They put a squid on top and a squid on bottom and they wire those together and bring them to one wire, run them up my pants leg, up through here, and down through my shirt and into my hand and on the button. So when the rhino charges and the horn comes up this way, what they've done, they've sanded my pants leg and they planted this, this metal plate over my leg and put two squids on it. And on top of that, they've got a balloon. I think the balloon was oblong and about this long and about that thick, full of blood. Normal, looked like blood, it's not blood. And <clears throat> when I press the button, when that horn comes up and goes by my leg, I press the button. That button hits the squid, it blows the blood off, and the top of my pant leg goes off. And then, of course, they cut to the close shot that Howard Hawks made of the, of the horn going through the leg. You can't tell the difference in the movie, but that's how it was supposed to go. Well, as we were doing the shot, instead of the guy driving, he's supposed to, when the horn comes up, he's supposed to turn to the right. All this conversation went on, he forgot what he was doing. And he turned and went to the left, and when he did, 
the horn, went underneath the left front seat where I was sitting, and flipped the Jeep. The Jeep went over two times in the air. He and I both fell out. The Jeep little about 20 feet away, and the rhinos turned and started back for us. The camera car saved us. They drove in between us and the rhino, and they got the rhino to follow the camera car out. That's just one time. <laughs> <clears throat> Wow. Things happen that you don't count on. Things happen that you're not, you're not even thinking about. You're thinking about the shots you're going to do and how we're going to do it. And so they said, well, we knew how to, what we were going to do, and, we sh and it would have worked fine, except for the one thing, the guy turned the wrong way in the Jeep. So we're going to go back and do it. We did it the second time. It worked out fine. But in many, many instances in the motion picture business, you'll find where you set something up and you put it all together and you know it's going to work, because you've done it before, or you know it's very practical, it's an easy thing to do. And then at the very last minute, something happens that you have to change it. Either a camera moves to a wrong position, or they put a different lens on, or some director's calling the cameraman from a, another shot. Anything can happen where they change the scene, but they don't, t they don't tell you, the stuntman, what's been changed. The communication falls apart. From this, that, we have a man that he's gone now too, but he lost a leg on a shot where we had a bunch of trees, uh, telephone poles, on the bed of a flat car train. And we had them where they rolled. At a certain period of time, they're supposed to break loose and fall off. And we, he was standing, he's standing on top of them. And they said, here's the one thing we have to remember. Just before they roll, we have to let him know so he gets a foot stance and a handhold with a chain handhold so he, he can make himself study so he doesn't go with those when they start rolling. Well, everything went fine and dandy except at the last minute they forgot to tell him that they're going to roll the logs. They rolled him. He went underneath the, the uh, flatbed, cut half of his face off and cut his left leg off. So the thing... The, the, things like that happen in the motion picture business. You, you, things that you don't think or don't expect to happen, happen because people neglect or forget to do certain things they're supposed to do. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, any more questions there? I have one more. Last one. Uh, do you know what happened to the first mask in part four? Because there were two masks used and one disappeared on set. Do you know what may have happened to it? Sure I know. <laughs> <laughs> I took it home. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. I think that's, uh, that's probably it. No, no. I only had it for one day. The little, there was a little boy lived next door to us. I think I told you part of this yeah. earlier, and he came down with cancer. I'm not, I'm not the hockey master. That's what I'm going to tell you. Oh, okay. You're getting a little ahead of my story. <laughs> I gave him the hockey mask. That's what happened to it. And the hood. So we got them both. Okay. Not bad. You got the rubber, the rubber one that you made. They know, did you know they made a rubber one that went over my whole head mm -hmm. okay, and glued it down around my neck? Mm -hmm. well, he, I gave him that one, and I gave him the regular hockey mask. Uh, to, today, if I had that hockey mask, not a doubt in my mind that I could get fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for it. Easily. And I'm, I know people here that don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that seems to be some kind of a magic thing for the, that hockey mask in that particular show. For sure. I don't know if it's still true or not. Okay, last one, and then we're gonna get out of here. Uh, there's a video game out there right now, Friday the 13th, by uh, Gun Media. Uh, did anybody from that company contact you about using your likeness? No. Did any of them... C contact you about using your li likeness for the video game that just came out? No. Well, All Jason's likenesses are in that video, featured in that video game. I was just wondering if anybody from that company contacted you about that. You know? Now, Kane Hodder talked to me. Uh, well, I have to, I have to go backwards. Uh, wait. Kane, Kane had a, I don't know if post, people in here don't know this, or maybe you do, had a documentary made about him. Anybody in here know that? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. He came to me and said, Ted, I'm going to have this documentary made. And he said, we like to shoot the documentary at your house. Now, 
I don't want you to start thinking I got some great mansion or somewhere, because I don't. But I have a house on an acre in Woodland Hills, which is a very nice place to live and a nice house. But it's all opened out in, in the back. And I, uh, there's, in, in the acre, the house sets right in the middle until I've got a lot of ground in front and a lot of ground in the back. And I have a barn in the back with horses. So they wanted to shoot there. And uh, he said, this, when this documentary is out, I'll get you a copy of it. And the documentary was about him. I don't know if you people know this or not about how badly he was burned before he got in the business. How many of you here don't know that story? Don't know it? Well, there's a lot. Well, I'm not gonna tell his story. <laughs> well, no, he'll tell it to you. Some, sometime he'll do a, a voice thing like this and he'll, he'll talk to you about it. Uh, he's an extraordinary, unbelievable guy from the things that I know personally about him. Now I've lost my thought, where the hell am I? They never contacted you for the video no. game. No, they never, they never asked me anything about uh, uh, doing uh, another Friday the 13th or playing the part of Jason or anything. Yeah, nothing to do with the video game either. No, uh, nothing. Awesome. Uh, great questions. There are some very excellent questions you all posed uh, here for today. I just want everybody, if you can, stand up, give this man the round of applause that he deserves and for a great career that he's had. Thank you so much, Mr. Ted White, for being with us.